and I were musing one day about how you can be talking to somebody and having a conversation, but at the same time, you're thinking something else. It's like you can think two different things at once. Oh, that's interesting. And every, everybody's nodding because you, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> sure. This is a very widespread phenomenon. So we were both sort of engineering types, and the question naturally arose for us anyway, how many times in a row can you do this? How many times in a row can you notice what's in the back of your mind while you're talking about something? And you switch to talking about that, and after a while, you notice something else now in the back of your mind that's about this topic. How many times can you do that? Does it go on forever? You go around in circles? What happens? So we tried it. Each of us, one of them sort of listening and guiding the process and reminding of what you, what you were supposed to be paying attention to, and the other one doing it. So it was purely experiential. You were, or phenomenological, whatever you call it. And it, it wasn't therapy at the time. It was just an exploration of a mental phenomenon. So it, that would be sort of interesting to try, wouldn't it, as an intro to this? Okay. That's where that's where I was back in about 54, thing, thinking about this. And it took another 20 years before it occurred to me that this might have something to do with psychotherapy. Uh, isn't this, in fact, where your levels in your book came from? Well, it was, yes. Uh, it, that had an influence on it because I was examining, I was trying to look at things that I was taking for granted about experience. And I think one of the first ones was I noticed that when I look around, I see objects. You know, people, furniture, rugs. All of a sudden, the whole world is made up of objects configurations of things, static configurations. Well, that was interesting. And it looked to me as though everybody sees the world that way. And then I realized, well, there's also something else that's totally different from that. It's called motion or change. That you see not only objects, but you see objects moving. And that's a different phenomenon. The movement is, or the change, you know, change like that sphere we were looking at earlier, changing shape. And suddenly changes are all that there is. And then I went down a level and I thought, well, what are objects made of that aren't just more objects? You know, a chair is a rung and a seat and all those, those are just more objects. But what's it made of that isn't an object? And I finally figured that out. It's called sensations. Brown, green, shading, bright, you know, edge. Things that are not objects in themselves, but of which every object is made. Ah, now I've got three levels. You know, sensations are per perceived at another level as objects. Objects are perceived as, at another level as movement, change, motion. And then I stuck in one above that called events. An event is a pattern of objects in motion that create a specific finite package of perception. Okay, so a ball bounces. Well, bouncing is falling, coming back up, you know, all kinds of things. That's how I got to it. It was mostly just trying to, to back up and look at what I was perceiving and try to see what it is that I was perceiving. What's it made of and what's it part of? And so I ended up with nine, all, when I put out the book, I guess, no, the first paper on this was in 1960. And there were five levels then. No, I noticed some more. And then by the time the 73 book came out, there were nine. And then a couple of guys in the control systems who pointed out to me that my definition of the fourth or fifth level was self-contradictory. So... We puzzled that one out and got two more levels out of it. And now we're at 11. So I don't know if they're real or not. You know, trouble is, people keep coming up to me and saying, now, which level comes before which one? And, and I have to say, well, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> that's, the, that's the whole question, you know. Is this just me who sees the world this way, or is, are we talking about something we share as human mm -hmm. beings? Are they ordered, though? Yeah, they're ordered. Well, the, the one of the principles is that the that the 
items at a given level are composed of the items at the next level below. And in order to control one item, you have to alter perceptions at the level below. So there were some criteria that made it a little more organized, you know, a little more systematic. But it did come out of this kind of introspection, but it's not the usual kind where you say, you know, the richness of the wherefore and all of that. This was really looking outward at the world and saying, how is my world put together out there, the way it's seemingly out there? And, yeah. So it has some historical foreground background. Oh, yeah. I'd read that stuff, you know, and it impressed me, some of the things, the things on synesthesia and, you know, the, what do they call it, the sensorium commune or something, you know, that's the lowest levels that everything is made of. The lowest level, by the way, is intensities. It's just how much. But it's also a theory of perception. Yeah. That you're perceiving. In categories. In categories. And in related categories, a particular kind of relationship. So that's where that came from. But anyway. It's interesting, too. Did you say something? A lot of things in psychology come about by perception. For example, when Rorschach did the Rorschach cards. Yeah. They're never intended as projective identification. Oh, really? They are strictly tests of perception. And if you read the early stuff, and I'm not a big Rorschach person, but if you read the original book by Herman Rorschach, it's strictly perception. He thought that ought to look like a butterfly to everybody. Just perception. Perception. And even Gestalt's perception. Yeah, yeah. Oh, perceptive. The origin, yeah, Kohler and all that stuff. Right. Kohler, I quote him in my book, actually. Well, anyway, how we got onto this was this idea of taking perceptions apart. But in a particular way for the method of levels, where you are concerned with one kind of perception and you find another view in the back of your mind about the first one. And it's that being about the first one that's the critical point. When somebody says, you know, I was walking down the street and I saw him coming by, but I looked away. That's just a report. But if he says, I was walking down the street and I saw somebody and I stupidly looked away, meaning I made a big mistake. Well, that stupidly tells you there's something up here observing that and making a comment about it. It was stupid. That's different from the content of what he's saying to you. So you become sensitive to those things where you catch the commentary in the background. The person himself might actually not even realize he said it. Or it flits by so fast he realizes it and then forgets it. So would that be superego in psychodynamic therapy? If it's at the right level, yeah, it would be. Could be. But I don't try to relate this. One reason I went into this at length was so that you can forget it. Now, the, the levels as I define them are irrelevant in the method of levels because they are not proven. They're, they could be just me. The point in the method of levels is that there are relative levels. Some things are relatively Mm. higher, apparently, than others, because they're about them. They're they're looking at them. And that's the only thing you need to know about levels for the method of levels. Does it have anything to do with a level coming from the foreground versus the background? Well, generally, I think the the sort of things we identify as background thoughts are generally of a higher level, I think, because they're, they're more like generalizations about the foreground. And, uh, well, we should try this. You know, you want, you want to try it? This is something everybody can do. Yeah, I think As I'm talking, you know, obviously you've all been having some thoughts in the background you haven't been talking about. You want to say